Uh, my name is Will Williams. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, and it's my very great pleasure to uh, be uh, introducing our speaker for today. Uh, on behalf of the Political Science Department and the University of Victoria, I would like to start by acknowledging uh, that we are on the territories of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples and on the traditional territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Our speaker today uh, perhaps needs no introduction, but I'll do a very brief one anyway. Uh, Dr. Kyle Kirkup is an assistant professor in the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Common Law. Uh, he is widely published in a number of uh, legal and uh, social science journals and is working currently on a book length manuscript based on his research uh, with the University of British Columbia Press titled Law and Order Queers, Respectability, Victimhood, and the Carceral State. Uh, he is a decorated young legal scholar. Uh, he has a doctorate in law from the University of Toronto Faculty of Law and a master's degree from Yale University. Uh, he was a 2013 Trudeau Scholar and a Shirt Canada Graduate Scholar. Uh, he is perhaps at the cutting edge of this field uh, amongst Canadian legal scholars, and it's our very great pleasure to have him here today to present his current research on the origins of gender identity in the Anglo-American legal tradition. Without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Kyle Kirkman. I want to start by thanking the Department of Political Science for the warm invitation, in particular Professor Graves uh, for the, the invitation and for your general um, wonderful hospitality. I'd also like to thank the Trans Archives. Um, when I was a doctoral student, I actually um, flew out to Victoria to, to go to the archives, and some of the things that I found in the archives are actually helped to form the basis for uh, my doctoral work and now for the larger book length project. So uh, thank you as well for your intellectual uh, generosity. So today what I want to do is I want to track some of the origins of gender identity and gender expression in Anglo-American legal discourse. And uh, this project has just been published as part of what we think is the first standalone issue uh, published by a Canadian law journal on trans legal issues. Uh, it's published in the University of Toronto Law Journal, and it's called uh, Transfiguring Justice, Trans People and the Law. Uh, so there's four uh, interesting articles covering a variety of different areas. So I just want to start by setting the table a little bit. What we started to see in Canada and the United States and the United Kingdom is really the emergence of lawmakers um, attempting to try to introduce uh, explicit formal uh, protections for trans and or non-binary people on the basis of gender identity and gender expression. So you can think, for example, of Canada uh, in June 2017, the Parliament of Canada, uh, this bill, Bill C-16, received royal assent. You can see there Minister of Justice Jody Wilson-Raybould. Randy Boissonneau and one of the, 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 the children who was involved with helping to push forward with uh, human rights recognitions federally. And so what Bill C-16 does, as we know, is it adds the terms gender identity and gender expression to federal human rights statute, the Canadian Human Rights Act, as well as the hate crimes provisions of the criminal code. And as of 2017, we've also seen both provincially and territorially that every jurisdiction across Canada has introduced similar kinds of protections. We've seen the same thing happen in both the United States. We've seen 18 states and the District of Columbia introduce explicit anti-discrimination protections in law, um, as well as a similar piece of legislation uh, in 2016 in the United Kingdom that would have added the term gender identity to the Equality Act. Um, so there's been really interesting body of scholarship that's emerged in this area, very multidisciplinary. Uh, there's you know, legal writers, uh, trans law uh, actors, there are uh, all kinds of kind of critical oriented scholars that are looking at this issue. And, and by and large, the scholarship is kind of broken out into three parts. There's been the kind of people that are really, really super enthusiastic about human rights law protections, right? There's been the group um, that is very critical of this development, right? You can think of scholars like Dean Spade, who are critical of the na naming and placement of identities in law and what that might do to kind of mask underlying structural inequalities, uh, particularly for those situated at multiple axes of oppression. And then there's kind of a third group of scholars that are in the midst of toggling between those more optimistic and critical approaches to say, well, if lawmakers are going to make law we might as well try to get curious about um, what kinds of opportunities and challenges there might be here in kind of a more pragmatic orientation. Um, so the scholarship is really rich, fascinating. Um, and so in this 
this project, I'm, I'm going to try to sidestep some of those normative questions um, because what I wanted to do was kind of take a step back and figure out where did these terms come from in the first place, right? So we're using these terms like gender identity and gender expression. Um, but what I started to notice is that many uh, lawmakers and other proponents and opponents of the bill were using these terms that no one seemed to have a very good sense of what they actually uh, meant. And so what I wanted to do was to go back to kind of first principles to say, where did these terms come from? Uh, how did they start to find themselves received in human rights law? And then hopefully the kind of so what question is, what, might, what clues might we, we have about the future directions of the field in view of this kind of historical his, uh, development? So, pose three research questions in this project. Uh, the first is really that first uh, origin story, right? Where did these terms come from? Okay. The second question then asks, okay, we have these terms. How do they start to be received in human rights law? And then the last question uh, is really, what are the implications for contemporary Anglo-American human rights law? And so, in view of the, hist uh, the history of these terms, what I try to do in the paper is point to the work of um, scholars like Eve Kosofty Sedgwick, who argued that there can often, in the terms of gender and sexuality, there can often be this tension between universalizing and minoritizing accounts of gender and sexuality. So a minoritizing account would tend to focus on trying to delimit a very small class of people who might be protected in law, right? So kind of very narrow um, legal methodology around particular identities. Whereas a universalizing account might try to say what kinds of disciplinary systems of sex and gender are imposed on all members of society. So this tension between minoritizing and universalizing, I argue, shows up very clearly in the body of uh, transgender human rights law. So I want to kind of grapple with some of those, those questions in this, in this paper. So what you'll notice pretty quickly when you start to look at the advent of these laws is that there are no formalized kind of definitions in most of the legal instruments that have been passed in Canada and the United Kingdom and the United States. And so what you start to see is a series of extra legal actors uh, stepping in to provide interpretive meaning to these terms. Um, and at, at the moment, I'm actually doing a project with uh, Professor Lee Ayrton at Queen's University where we're looking at publicly funded school boards and the ways in which they're actually starting to take these undefined terms and provide more uh, interpretive meaning to them. So where we go, we tend to go, is we go to the Ontario Human Rights Commission and we see here that we start to get a bit of a sense of how the two terms are being used in law. So you can see from the slide, the gender identity is really being constructed as a kind of interior looking construct, right? Uh, you can see the language of a uh, person's gender identity may be the same or different as the one of their birth assigned sex, fundamentally different from sexual orientation. And gender expression, you see, starts to become more of an externally uh, demonstrated or performed construct, right? You can see this focus on outward behavior, appearance, dress, makeup, a variety of different kinds of externally performed uh, aspects. Okay, so now, now what I've done is I've kind of started to set the table. And what I want to do is now take us back all the way into the 1960s and to really take you into the emergence of gender identity as a concept. And, <clears throat> sorry. So we go back to 1963 and we see the, uh, the emergence of gender identity uh, being presented by two doctors, Dr. Stoller and Dr. Greenson, um, who construct gender identity as part of this symposium on homosexuality. And you start to see very quickly that this term uh, is formed by two doctors and very quickly starts to be uh, taken up by a variety of other actors using the DSM-3. And so what starts to happen is that rather than using the term gender identity, we actually see uh, the lawmakers begin to use other kinds of terms. In particular, 
1975 decision of the city of Minneapolis demonstrates that the term is not uh, gender identity, but rather affectional preference, right? So you see uh, a variety of actors starting to pick up on other terms rather than gender identity in constructing uh, this version of what it means to uh, be recognized in, in law. So what happens in 1975 is we see, uh, what happens in 1975 is there, one year earlier had been this construction of affectional preference in, in uh, the city of Minneapolis. And so what lawmakers start to do is they decide to uh, basically tap on gender identity or a form of gender identity into the human rights statute, right? So we see this language of having or projecting a self-image not associated with one's biological maleness or one's biological femaleness. And following Minneapolis's lead, we see a series of other jurisdictions start to very quickly pass anti-discrimination ordinances. Uh, you see this happen throughout the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, but what's really interesting is that none of these early jurisdictions are actually using the term gender identity at all. In fact, they're using affectional preference, sometimes they're using transsexual status, a variety of other kinds of uh, terminology. And so what I wanted to do is figure out, okay, when does gender identity actually start to surface in law? And so I go back to the reported cases from Canada, from the United States, and from the United Kingdom, and it turns out that actually the migration of this term is being done by experts. So experts that are being called in a series of cases, sometimes involving criminal activities or family law issues or employment law issues, you see experts being called to testify and they start to use the term gender identity that's produced in 1963 in a series of reports that they're issuing. So really interesting then that we actually have a very kind of biomedical understanding of gender identity being constructed by two doctors at a symposium in 1963 in Stockholm. You then see uh, the, the emergence of uh, social movements that start to push for explicit anti-discrimination protections. And then by the 1980s, you see experts being called to testify in cases and this notion of gender identity starting to very slowly uh, percolate and trickle into the, the law. So then we get to 1994, and for the first time we see the city of San Francisco add the term gender identity expressly to its uh, local uh, anti-discrimination ordinance. And then finally, we get four years later to 1998, and the BC Human Rights Commission recommends adding gender identity to the BC Human Rights Code. And this is the first example where we have a commission that is pushing for the explicit recognition of uh, gender identity. So the story then that I want to tell about gender identity is that it's a term that's coined by two doctors in the 60s. There's then a series of developments that happen in law, none of which use the term gender identity. And we don't actually see gender identity really show up in legal discourse until the early 1980s as a direct consequence of um, experts being called to testify in cases involving uh, criminal issues, family law issues, and employment law uh, issues. Um, so I just wanted to give us a little bit of Victoria um, context for this talk. The same year that the BC Human Rights Commission becomes the first Human Rights Commission to add gender, uh, recommend adding gender identity to the code, we actually have the first case in Canada to uh, actually be reported using the term gender identity. And this is a case that was brought by uh, a woman named Tawny Sheridan who alleged discrimination at a club in Victoria called BJ's Lounge. Um, so at the time, because gender identity had not been explicitly recognized in law, uh, Sheridan decides to bring her case on the basis of sex and disability. Uh, rather than gender identity. But what's really fascinating is I went back to the reported record and she actually pushed for uh, an amendment to her statement of claim where she tried to argue that indeed gender identity ought to be uh, recognized. The, the judge ultimately said that recognition requires a legislative change in the BC government and 
Uh, she ultimately was unsuccessful on that basis, but on the merits of the case, she was ultimately successful. Uh, there was a finding of the tribunal that she had been discriminated against on the basis of sex and disability, uh, and ultimately she was uh, ordered, they were ordered to, to pay $2,000. And so what's interesting then is that the first explicit uh, recognition of gender identity in Canadian law happens in 2002. In 2002, the Northwest Territories becomes the first jurisdiction in Canada to formally recognize gender identity as a prohibited ground of discrimination. And this happens basically because up until this point, the Northwest Territories does not have a standalone human rights regime. And so when they're, they're considering what the most modern, contemporary, up-to-date uh, system might look like, uh, there's a decision made that to be as inclusive as possible, gender identity ought to be considered as one of the prohibited grounds. And so throughout this, this discussion of gender identity then, um, you can see given the intellectual origins of the term as a term that's coined by doctors, that starts to emerge in law through uh, medical experts, you can see really gender identity being a very narrow, kind of minoritizing account that tends to focus on more biomedical kinds of indicators of identity and experience, which I argue is very, very different from the emergence of gender expression, which starts to happen uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, so I, what I wanted to then do is, is flip gears a little bit and focus on the emergence of gender expression. And rather than being able to locate kind of two doctors who coined a term in 1963, in the gender expression context, what I found was actually far more complicated and opaque. Um, you don't really see gender expression emerge as a standalone concept until uh, the 1990s into about the year 2000. Um, and I argue that this, this shift tends to coincide quite uh, closely with the emergence of more performative or postmodern theories of, of gender. So you can see that rather than having its origins in a kind of biomedical story produced by psychiatrists, right, instead in the gender expression context, you see uh, a focus on performative theories of, of gender. So rather than a more universal or a minoritizing construct, you see more of a universalizing notion of, of gender expression. So, um, you start to see lawmakers take up this uh, push for more expansive understandings of gender in 2000, when New York City becomes the first jurisdiction in the Anglo-American world to expressly uh, add the term gender expression to its, uh, its uh, local anti-discrimination ordinance. And what was interesting about this development was that nobody really seemed, commentators at the time, went back and did a media scan of, of the term during this period, and what I found was that uh, people were kind of found, found this development to be completely unremarkable, right? Uh, that New York City, in adding the term uh, gender expression to its uh, local ordinance, was just kind of getting on to the human right, rights train with other jurisdictions that had already uh, done this. And so the first case that actually uses the term gender expression in Canada is a 2006 decision, a case called Forrester versus Peel, which involved uh, discrimination in a policing setting. And again, what was fascinating to me was the term gender expression again emerges as a direct consequence of expert evidence. So there is a, a woman, who, a trans woman, who was uh, called to testify in the case of Forrester to uh, give evidence about discrimination. She uses the term gender expression as part of a report that she uh, tables with the tribunal, and ultimately the tribunal member making a decision about whether or not there is discrimination picks up some of the findings of the, the, the term. So again, I think part of the policy, policy story here is that sometimes policies can be really uh, robustly constructed as a result of a lot of um, careful deliberation and consideration, and then other times, uh, policies can be the complete opposite, right? That they can be simply as, as, as accidental as an expert being called to testify in a particular matter. The word gets taken up by tribunal members and ultimately then the word starts to um, circulate in, in law and policy. Okay, so I've now tried to set the table a little bit to focus on gender identity as a kind of 
uh, uh, biomedical uh, minoritizing understanding of gender, whereas gender expression, I argue, is a much newer concept and emerges with the advent of uh, performative theories of gender. And so what I wanted then to do is figure out how in view of these two parallel histories that have such different kinds of normative preoccupations, how is it that moving forward, as we start to look towards 2017, how is it that these two terms that come out of entirely different historical moments with entirely different kinds of preoccupations, how is it that we have these terms set together? Right? How is it that gender identity, which comes out of 1963, and gender expression coming out in the, the, the 90s into the 2000s, how is it that in law, these two terms are starting to walk uh, together? Um, and so the first instance, as I talked about, is New York City in 2000 with gender expression. In Canada, the first time we see gender identity and gender expression work together is 2012, when Ontario introduces Toby's Act, uh, which adds both terms to the Ontario Human Rights Code. And what we start to see is after 2012, over the next five years, virtually every jurisdiction engages in the same kind of process, with every jurisdiction except Manitoba and Saskatchewan deciding to use both gender identity and gender expression. Um, and this happens in, I would argue, a fairly uncontroversial way. You go to look at the Hansard debates related to Toby's Act, and what you find is that no one's really talking about, isn't it kind of weird that we have these two terms that we're adding to law that are very different, they have different uh, kinds of histories, they're defined in very different kinds of ways. Um, the Hansard debates, I would argue, are far more about um, you know, the benefits of human rights protections, a fairly kind of um, uncritical understanding of adding human rights uh, and the prospect of adding uh, human rights. What's interesting is when you compare this development in Ontario to the federal level, I think you see a far more complicated kind of story. Uh, you turn to the federal level and you see that when you go back to some of the precursors to Bill C-16, some of the uh, private members bills that were introduced by the NDP, you see a really strong tension and debate happening uh, within both the House of Commons and uh, the Senate. So for example, Bill C-279, one of the precursors to Bill C-16, um, there was a proposal that it would add both uh, gender identity and gender expression to the federal uh, Canadian Human Rights Act as well as to the criminal code provisions. Um, and what's fascinating is that during that debate, um, the, the debate got so heated and there was a suggestion that this bill was so unlikely to pass that uh, proponents of the bill decided to take out the term gender expression altogether. And the reason they did that was really kind of this fear about the, the kind of universalizing nature of gender expression. So to pick up on that theme of uh, minoritizing and universalizing, right, you see uh, the direct consequence of this history showing up in what lawmakers are doing with Bill C-279. So proponents say, oh, we're not going to get this thing passed if we have gender expression. We've been told by some of our conservative colleagues that if we have gender expression, it's not going to pass. They decide to get rid of gender expression. Uh, it then passes through the House of Commons by a razor-thin um, margin in March 2013. And then the, the bill finds itself completely stalled in the Senate. You can see uh, uh, senators like Senator Don Plett, very uh, anti uh, trans uh, rhetoric happening in the, in, the, in the discussions that are happening around uh, Bill C-279. And so ultimately, there is an, a federal election that's called, uh, and when this happens, the bill dies on the order paper. And so Bill C-279, which would have had a uh, very much more limiting kind of application because it only would have included gender identity, it's off the table. So then we get to fall 2015, we have the federal election, we have the Liberals come to power, and suddenly Bill C-16 is back, and suddenly gender identity and gender expression are back on the table. There's no more proposal about trying to provide very limiting kinds of definitions for both terms. Um, and so what, what's interesting is that once this happens, the thing sails through the House of Commons, the Liberals and the NDP and the Greens support it, and, and many members of the Conservative Party support it, and then we get the thing to the Senate, 
and at the same time, um, a series of commentators, mostly operating out of the University of Toronto, emerge that try to tell this new story about Bill C-16, that somehow it's going to erode freedom of expression, that suddenly any time that someone um, uh, misgenders someone, it's going to constitute a hate crime. There's a series of, I would argue, moral panics that start to happen uh, where these commentators with very little grounding in law try to construct this story about what Bill C-16 is going to do. And during those debates, again, you see this debate happening about whether gender identity and gender expression are too minoritizing or too universalizing. And you see many of the conservative critics of the bill really um, glomming onto this notion of a universalizing problem. You saw uh, some members in the Senate saying that gender expression was far too expansive, it could apply to too many different kinds of circumstances, and, and you see them pushing for very much a minoritizing kind of term. So they say, well, we're worried about gender expression, but we might be able to accept a far more minoritizing biomedical term like transsexual status. So you go back to some of these debates and you see lawmakers trying to push the, the construction of human rights law out of a universalizing frame back into a minoritizing frame by focusing on the way we do that. Another option that was put on the table by some senators was the construction of a gender identity register. So some, some kind of a federal system that would require folks to register with the government in order to have government issued identity documents that reflected uh, who they were. And so you see in all of those, those really troubling debates this worry about gender expression being too expansive, right? That it's too universalizing, it's too destabilizing. We would much prefer a kind of minoritizing account that focuses on something like transsexual status or gender identity uh, register. So, fascinating history of two terms. One term being coined in 1963, another term starting to coalesce in the 1990s showing up in law and continuing this long um, struggle between universalizing and minoritizing accounts. So in the last uh, part of the paper, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what uh, this whole history might tell us about future directions in the field. There's a flurry of recent legal developments that are happening in Canada and other Anglo-American jurisdictions that I think um, very much are indebted to this history that I've just tried to, to, to lay out. Um, we're seeing a series of uh, trans and or non-binary claimants bring uh, human rights challenges. You can think, for example, of Joshua Ferguson, who is an activist and filmmaker who requested a non-binary birth certificate from the Ontario government. You're seeing across the country push uh, towards um, uh, gender neutral markers on identity documents and I think we're going to continue to see those kinds of claims moving forward. There's another claim from British Columbia where there was uh, a parent uh, who uh, wanted to have the BC government issue a health card that declared the baby as having an un undeclared sex. Um, so this is another human rights issue that we're going to continue to see uh, moving forward. Um, so these cases are profoundly important. I think they raise really interesting questions about how the administrative state structures sex and gender and how it imposes a series of incentives uh, and disincentives on people. At the same time, we're also seeing um, a growing number of cases involving cisgender claimants. And the cisgender claimants piece of the puzzle, I think, is the one that is in some ways the most perplexing. Um, so be very much looking forward to any thoughts you might have on, on how we think about some of these recent cases that are moving forward. So there's been a, a case from 2016 that was brought by an individual named Christopher Brown. Uh, and Mr. Brown uh, worked at a mining uh, company in Sudbury. And he is a cisgender man who had a pretty large beard. And he argued that his beard was fundamental to the ways in which he expressed his gender identity to the world. Um, and so he argued that when his employer required him to shave his beard, that that constituted a form of gender expression discrimination. Uh, his employer required him to uh, uh, shave the beard because he was working in a mine, he was wearing a respirator, and the, the rationale was the, the respirator is not going to work properly if you have a big beard, we need you to shave it. Um, and so Mr. Brown uh, 
very quickly gloms on to what's happened with Toby's Act in 2012 and says this is a form of gender expression discrimination. I use my beard to express who I am. Um, it's important to me because I grew it after some men in my family um, were diagnosed with cancer. I want to support the November campaign. And ultimately, the tribunal does not know what to do with this case, right? So on the one hand, the tribunal says, well, Toby's Act was really supposed to be about trans and non-binary people and anti-discrimination for um, trans and non-binary people. But at the same time, this term that's being used is gender expression, and we're being told by the Ontario Human Rights Commission that we're supposed to be focusing on kind of external performative dimensions of gender, things like dress, speech, pronouns, so perhaps beards ought to be included within that kind of basket of gender expression protections. But ultimately, the tribunal, rather than seeing the kind of universalizing potential of Brown, they, they lean on a much more minoritizing account, and they say, well, Ultimately, Toby's Act is not really for people like Mr. Brown. This is not a form of gender expression that we're going to recognize in law. Um, but they then leave us with this fascinating caveat where they say, well, but in the future, there could be cases brought by cisgender people who may have experienced gender expression discrimination that would be targeted uh, or captured by the Ontario Human Rights Code. Uh, which then brings me to another really interesting case percolating in Ontario, a woman named Geneviève Lassell. Uh, she's a cisgender woman who works at an Eastside Mario's. Uh, her employer allegedly told her that she must wear a bra while she's uh, serving. And she has uh, launched a human rights complaint. And again, you could think about uh, uh, Ms. Lassell's uh, complaint as really being about one of uh, gender expression discrimination, given the kind of expansive definition that we have from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, right? Um, where there's, there's direct language of clothing, uh, gender performance, that she could argue that this case is best understood as a form of uh, gender expression discrimination rather than, for example, a form of sex-based uh, discrimination. And so I think moving forward, we are going to continue to see these cases that grapple with how we draw lines around who ought to be protected by human rights law and who ought not to be. And given the history of the terms gender identity and gender expression, I think that it will probably prove to be quite unsurprising that tribunals are going to be struggling with how we do this, right? Are we going to end up with a more minoritizing kind of account? Or are we going to end up with some kind of a more universalizing account? And what are the implications for that uh, moving forward? And so I suppose the ultimate conclusion then is that um, history matters in some ways, um, and that we ought to be attentive to the ways in which uh, the historical moments that produce particular kinds of ideas actually have quite a lot of salience for the present. Um, when we think about the future directions of the field, I think in view of the history of gender identity as a kind of 1960s biomedical term, versus gender expression as a kind of 1990s uh, performative term, that we will continue to see lawmakers struggling with exactly this tension. And as I will say, um, law tends to be quite uncomfortable with uncertainty, right? With uh, those uh, who do not readily fit within um, kind of pre-existing legal structures. And so you will see tribunal members, I think, really grappling with this interpretive uh, tension moving forward. So with that, I'll leave it there and look very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you.